doctor Lluís. Ara, i per acabar, és el torn del doctor Zimanski. És el director d'un centre de recerca, el Social Cognitive Networks, un centre de recerca de Nova York, on s'investiguen les eines socials, els seus aspectes conductius i la dinàmica que pren tot això a la xarxa. Avui ens parlarà del desplegament de les opinions a la xarxa i de quina influència tenen per la resta de la població. proximity when people were talking face to face and no objective record of such interactions existed and you know how human memory is deceiving we remember what we want to remember in an almost two weeks later two people involved in a single talk would have two stories three people would have five stories and so on so clearly what changed today we have objective record in terms of the tweets, for example, if the interaction is through the tweets, or at least the time of the cell phone, if the uh, communication was through the cell phone, or emails, or blogosphere, or Facebook. And sometimes it's becoming embarrassing because something which is so hot, it was very funny when we were, say, 15 or 16 on Facebook, when the, these people are becoming 18 or 20, they see that it is not so funny anymore, and it still exists on the internet. I am leading a center which looks exactly at these issues. How, first of all, how social networks change, because they do change if you, uh, I'm a bit older than most of the audience, but if you have children in the age of 10 or uh, older, you see the big difference, how they interact. You know, for them, reality is also a Twitter and, you know, a smartphone, and then they interact with their friends, which we didn't do. So definitely we look at this change and we also look how human brain, human limitations impact what we do. And then, of course, my friend, Pep Lewis, all of the talk that we want to help. We want to overcome the limitations of human brain by providing assisting technology. Advantage of assisting technology is that it doesn't need to sleep. We do. So therefore they can work you know, on our behalf when we are asleep. Now, networks is becoming a topic of the all, all own science. So this is why quite often we talk about network science, because what unites these different networks, and there are many of them, there is the router's internet, there is airline network, then we have wireless sensor network you know, in the city, or even we have high school friendship network, in the in the large net, in the large high school, those are high, U.S. high schools with different kind of students, showing how they interact and how they distribute their friendships. So all these networks can be studied from this fundamental point of view of network science, and it helps. In network science, we stress connection versus versus nodes. But even though we do that, still the human being a, a node makes it very difficult and very interesting at the same time. So, and here's the picture of the power of the crowd from known places, which you probably recognize. We have nodes as individuals, links as different kinds of relationships, friendship, people whom we interact at work in more organized way, family, which is unorganized, but also more formal. We know who are family and who is who, who is parent, who is child, not always, but most of the time. 
many individuals with their diverse social interactions is the core of cloud of networks in which we participate. Introverse is nested in many different social networks. And the question which we try to understand is how, on top of it, the existence of information network, internet, if it's social network includes cell phone network and so on, change dynamics of human interactions. And it's very interesting that we evolve in a central way, so these evolutionary forces, despite of all the changes in society, still exist in us. Still we uh, have this force of homophily, being friends with people similar to us, the force of proximity, we typically have friends from the places in which we are together, be the place of birth and childhood, or high school, or, or you know, or university in which you go, or work. And that is the basis which today may be changed because our friendship can be built over the internet without consideration of the distance. But what it has to do with industry? A lot. Because in fact, winning or creating the social network of people who believe in the company is the basis of success. Nobody understood it better than Jobs and his idea of the cool tools, creating the culture of Apple products and creating the committed uh, people who are looking and sort of devouring any new product lines for iPhones in a, in a row. That was the business model which is extremely difficult to create because it takes a visionary of the class of jobs to take advantage of it. But it definitely impacts processes. And looking at the history, because history is sort of easy to study, we look at the first example how social network decided the outcome of competition between something very, very standard, which is screw plates on the standard for the, for the screws. British, that's 19th century, ruled the world. That was the time, yes. And then they, of course, were dominant in the, in the industry. So the British uh, inventor, William Seller, uh, I'm sorry, the British inventor, Joseph White, he presented the first, the first, you know, standard. The standard was introduced in London in 1841. <coughs> This standard was not practical. The uh, uh, angle of the screws was very difficult to create uniformly all the time. So therefore factories were, you know, paying a lot of cost for tools and the screws were inexpensive. So practical American, 23 years later, introduced another standard which had different, different uh, you know, uh, uh, description of the of the of the screw uh, 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 thread, but it was much easier to produce and therefore much cheaper and faster. Despite that, it was not so easy to convince people who already had, you know, the usage of tools and everything else prepared for the British standard. So what make a difference that he used a social network of, of his friends and convince some of them to use his standard despite all the entrenched producers of the British standard. And then through these committed friends, he won the award in about 10 years. So all US manufacturers slowly switched to the new product. And then it was intuition. He understood that the first people who would apply his new invention against the existing standard must be somehow tied to him. So he found the net networks of the producers who knew him, who believed him, and as a the result they were first adopters and then that changed the world. So the point from this is that it was a small network of his friends and colleagues from the time of university in, you know, uh, 10 or 12 people who initially started that. But they were so committed and so proud that they had the better standards that they sort of talk around and the whole industry followed. So we look at this issue and wanted to understand how the social networks help to introduce innovation and help to change the world. 
because as you notice, one thing he did not talk about often, but in good robust country, industry is not forever. That industry is always fueled by new products and new innovations which need to replace the old ones. So the issue how to introduce new products is extremely important. But in many rural settings, overcoming the old traditions is not easy. So we learn that, for example, in comprehensive rural health pro uh, projects, it is very important to have committed people, like, for example, village health worker in India, who go into the villages, they are known to the people, they understand their concerns, and they are the best, the best sort of apostles of changing the health standards and provide the health advice, and they are sort of, we call them, committed. They believe that they improve the lives of people, and that way they are able to, to make a change. So, even lack of education for them was an advantage because they talk about these health changes in the language of villagers. So this is again the situation in which the network of small network of committed people were able to change the bigger, the bigger you know, communities believing in some other things. So we look also what happens, for example, in real social networks. When we look at the high school, when people start looking who, my, who are their friends, as the result, they quickly diversify into three separate groups. They are separated by the grade and by the socioeconomic background. So rich kids interact more with rich kids, and as a result, poor kids would interact with poor kids in other places, and also higher grades look high on the lower grades and they don't consider them equal. So as a result, the bad thing happened. There are in this case, in this one high school, we have three groups which talk very little between themselves and really not, uh, you know, a lot is inside. So across the group, there are a few connections. Inside is most of the interactions. And of course, it's not a healthy situation. So the thing which changes that is using the value of commitment. Commitment is very well known in sports and religion, but we also have people who are committed, like I mentioned, people who bought the idea of Apple being a different computer, a different device, and then they believe that it always would be top of the standard, always innovative, and therefore they are committed to this line of products because of their value, but also because it creates a separate culture in which they believe. So when we introduce few students selected as apostles of change, those are these red, uh, red dots with the hello around them, they are trained to understand the value of making people treat each other equal. So the high school changes from this free diverse group because they go out, they meet, and they talk to everybody in the school, the school then changes into one big community. Something like that also happens in, in bigger communities, but it was easier to simulate. So, we started to see the effect and understand how many such apostles of change or committed people are needed as minority in order to convince everybody to change. Surprisingly very few. In most of the networks, anything between 5 and 10 percent of community, if it becomes involved and deeply believes in the product or commit to the opinion, they would sway everybody else. Below that, they have no chance. It, to, it would take an enormous amount of time to make this conviction with smaller number of people. On the other hand, if we, if we have more than 10%, then the change is very quick, as you see here, and the, and the whole cloud becomes more and more red. Red here means people who are committed. As you see, there is almost all green, despite of the time, which is 10 times bigger than it is other products. Here, on the other hand, in very short time, everybody changes to red, adopting the opinion of the minority. Even more, the situation is more complicated when we have uh, two committed, uh, committed minorities, but the behavior is very typical for political systems. 
So, for example, when binaurals are almost equal, we are getting the situation of Italy after World War II, when the vacuum created by a Nazi party being eliminated created almost equal forces between leftists and rightists. As the result, for like 20 years, no government survived from one election to the other. They were failing like flies and then the power was changing hands very often. A little less rad radical was US, in which we had two strong parties, Republicans and Democrats, with all which is committed to them, but distinctly over the years, one party is a little bit more dominant, so then what happens, it is, you know, three cadences of president would be Democrats, two would be Republicans, equal but not exactly, then the trends may change, some, for example, become more active, so then Republicans were dominant, but it was orderly from election to election, no revolutions and no disruptions. And the third is the green case, when there was a strong domination of committed minority to, uh, to one opinion, and as a result it was the case of Sweden, in which case we had very stable social democrats ruling after the war for more than 20 years, because it was social consensus that was good. It fell apart because of high immigration and high cost of social support. And then again, situation became unstable. But what it has to do with the, with the, uh, how it could be used in the business, uh, I can explain on these slides. For whatever reason, it doesn't display the whole slide, but that's okay. First of all, there are two issues which could be resolved using the knowledge what is the word for commitment. One is in the case of the positive campaigns. When you want to promote the product, line of product, or new company with new idea, it is very important to understand that you don't need to reach everybody because it's almost impossible and extremely costly. Much better strategy is to find a group of people who are, who are enough of them, it will be about 10% of community, who are most plastic in a sense of accepting the idea and being sort of committed. Quite often they will be young generation because they are more open to new products and then you can use your campaign money to focus on this segment because then once you convince them the network effect will do the work for you. Second situation is when you defend your opinion about your company. So if something bad happens, take for example the big things, like for example, we had in uh, Mexico Bay this platform uh, for oil being destroyed, or for example, the failure of the reactor in Japan, then any manufacturer would provide it even a small piece to this failure uh, uh, device is under pressure, social pressure, because people would be seeking who is guilty. And then they, they have dilemma. If some people start questioning, or maybe it was the screws from this factor which caused that the reactor failed, they have to decide to step in into campaign and try to <coughs> protect their opinion about their company and reputation or not. Stepping in too early is bad because it attracts the attention of everybody else. If there are few of these people who question the company, then it's better to stay quiet because it will dissipate itself. If there are more than that, then it might be dangerous. So our research tells that if there are enough committed people believing that the company may be guilty, and the enough meaning 5 to 10 percent, it's better to step in and dispel, of course, if there is material basis for that, that the company didn't contribute to the failure. So clearly, in a public relation, both positive, trying to, to uh, create new campaign for the new product, as well as negative, trying to pr protect good reputation, knowledge of these dynamics is very important. So what I wanted to mention that these opinions are important because we diffuse faster than new, uh, than new products, so it's important to get a tough tipping point. And then focusing on creating minority of the critical size is essential. 
and then create future that would in your product which would encourage social interactions because that way the campaign would be taken to people by already first purchasers and first committed people so that is sort of very concrete advice our future research we would want to look whether we have more cases than the old case from 19th century of spread of products which was going with our, with our model and gather more data and match them with our model and finally we want also to see how game theoretic models may give us understanding what incentives you may to give to people to have them committed maybe lower prices for influential people maybe involving them in different ways so again putting into uh, uh, into view these these incentives is very helpful so that's all thank you for your attention questions